All right, chapter 18, regulation of genes in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So, of course, organisms, cells, and organisms in the cells they contain, they want to regulate what's going on inside them. As we've talked about, all just about all cells have the full complement of DNA, but each cell only uses a, a relatively small proportion of that DNA because a lot of it doesn't apply to that cell. So the way we can do this is through, uh, for example, seen here negative feedback in which, for example, tryptophan inhibits an early stepway in an in a biochemical pathway. So if you're trying to make tryptophan, but you already have plenty of it around, you don't need to make any more, so it can inhibit that pathway. You can also do that through the regulation of genes, which is what we're going to focus on here, um, such that you don't even make the enzymes in the first place when they're not needed. And so let's look at bacteria first and operons. We're going to look at the trip and the lac operon. So an operon is a cluster of genes that code for uh, enzymes that are used in the same biochemical pathway, and they are clustered together in the bacterial genome. They al it also includes an operator and a promoter, the promoter where the RNA polymerase binds, and the operator, as we'll see, is what binds with uh, a repressor. Again, all these genes are clustered and they're used for the same pathway so they can be transcribed together because they're all going to be needed. <clears throat> all right, the trip operon is uh, what's known as a um, repressible operon, and that is the presence of something, in this case tryptophan, represses the operon. The operon is in the on position normally, that is, there's this upstream gene that, pro that is responsible for coding for a protein known as the repressor, and you can see that repressor is produced in an inactive state. Thus, the operon will run. However, the presence of something, in this case tryptophan, turns the repressor into its active state. The tryptophan acts as a co-repressor. It binds with the operator, and the polymerase can't get past it and do its job. So tryptophan represses the operon, which makes sense because the point of the operon is the code for enzymes responsible for making tryptophan. Well, if you already have tryptophan present, you don't need to make it. Thus, the cell doesn't need to waste its time making all these gene products here. Okay tryptophan, a repressible operon. The lac operon, on the other hand, is what's known as an inducible operon because here the presence of something induces the operon, causes it to run. So in this case, the rep repressor is produced in an active state and it will bind with the operator and block polymerase and thus the operon will not go. However, the presence of lactose or a version of lactose in this case, will inactivate the repressor and thus the um, genes will be transcribed and you'll have the necessary enzymes to digest lactose, which makes sense because lactose is present and the cell can make use of it. Okay, so lactose, an inducible operon. Now the lac operon also has another level of control because these cells will make use of not only lactose, but glucose. And thus, if glucose is present, well, and if glucose is present, the cell prefers glucose over lactose. So you'll notice here, in this situation, look down here, lactose is present and glucose is present. Lactose is present, so the repressor is inactivated, the operon should run. But it doesn't because when glucose is present, there's this molecule called CAP, which is an inactive state. And CAP is basically a transcription factor that helps polymerase do its job. And when it's inactive, polymerase can't do its job. So in this case, because glucose is present, we don't run the lactose, the cell will preferentially feed on the glucose. However, if lactose is present but glucose is scarce or absent, 
then the cell wants to make use of the lactose. The lactose is present, the repressor is inactive, but also in this case, because of the lack of glucose, the CAP, this transcription factor, becomes activated by this stuff called cyclic AMP, which apparently is present when glucose is scarce. So this transcription factor will help the polymerase bind to the promoter, and then transcription will occur, and the cell will make use of that lactose. So again, the lac, ap lac, lac operon has a second level of control. Okay, so that's bacteria and operons. Operons are just in bacteria. If you see or hear that word, think bacterial control of transcription. Now let's look at uh, eukaryotes. So this image here shows us the different points at which you can control the expression of genes in a eukaryote. Um, we'll go through examples of these. You can do this at the DNA level, transcription, RNA processing, translation, uh, and you can modify the proteins and MRAs. All right, so let's move through here. So DNA first. All right, histone acetylation. You'll remember histones are the proteins that the DNA are wrapped around when they form these tight, uh, highly condensed chromosomes. Well, when you add acetyl groups to the histones, the histones have these little tails that stick off the side. It prevents the histones from clustering together, and so the DNA stays spread out, and it's easier to transcribe in that state. So histone acetylation opens up the DNA and makes it available for transcription. DNA methylation, on the other hand, is when you add methyl groups, particularly to the cytosines in DNA, and that binds up the DNA and keeps it from being transcribed. DNA methylation is also plays a role in what's called epigenetic inheritance, where one or the other of a particular gene, the allele of that particular gene, gets sort of bound up or locked up by methyl groups. And thus, even if an individual inherits it, it's not expressed. So you might inherit um, a form of the gene from mom or from dad that has been bound up this way, and so you're only going to express the one from the other parent. And um, this can happen, as we see in this figure, through the germline and is passed on from one generation to the next. Or it can happen due to maternal effects on offspring in which case um, the epigenetic factor is not inherited every generation, at least not the same one. Each generation is changed depend on, depending on maternal conditions or basically the environmental conditions that one is born into and raised. Okay, so that's the DNA level. So now, transcription. Well, as we saw, transcription involves use, using RNA polymerase to basically transcribe a section of DNA, a gene, and creating RNAs, um, in this case an mRNA. And now, in order for RNAs to be made, you have to have um, some things present. And that is you have to have transcription factors and activators that uh, bond to upstream enhancers on the DNA. So without the proper activators or transcription factors, the RNA polymerase won't get together with the promoter and transcribe that gene. So the gene, the DNA may be open and ready for business, but if the correct transcription factors and activators aren't there, that gene is not going to be transcribed because polymerase, RNA polymerase cannot do its job. So even though in our, ooh, what's going on? Stop that. Even though, there we go, each of our cells contains the complete genome, again, we only express a subset of those genes depending upon which of these activators and transcription factors are present in the cell. So while in the liver cell you have both the alb albumin and crystalline gene, and the same in the eye, you don't express the albumin gene in the eye because it's not necessary, but you do express the crystalline gene and you have the activators and transcription factors to help do that. And vice versa in the liver, you express the albumin gene but not the crystalline gene because that wouldn't make sense.
All right, so you can con con control transcription. And uh, this image shows us how, um, so you remember in a prokaryote, you have an operon where the genes for a particular biochemical, biochemical pathway are clustered together in the operon. But in a eukaryote, the genes that code for the enzymes needed for a pathway might be on different chromosomes. Well, what can happen is the portion of those chromosomes that contain that gene can be drawn together into this fancy term here, a transcription factory, in which the activators and transcription factors that are going to help tran with transcription of those genes can bring all those genes together and start transcribing them at the same time. So giving you the equivalent result is with an operon, but again, they're on different chromosomes. Okay, so now what about after transcription? Well, as we saw in the previous chapter with eukaryotes, the um, primary transcript or the initial transcript that's made has some extra stuff in it. So it has a number of exons, but it also has some introns that we splice out. And with alternative RNA splicing, where is it? There it is, alternative RNA splicing. From a single gene, we can create several trans, uh, gene products. That is, we can mix and match exons to get a different RNA from the same gene. And so depending on how the spliceosome, the type of RNA you have in your spliceosome, will determine essentially which ones you get cut in and which ones get, or which ones get spliced in, I should say, and which ones get left out. Okay, so alternative RNA splicing. Um, mRNAs, degradation, uh, that actually shows up in the next section. We'll talk about that here. Um, you can control whether or not translation happens. And once, for example, of course the point of all this is to make proteins, you can then, once proteins have been used and are no longer needed, you can target them for destruction, basically, or recycling, if you will. So this protein, ubiquitin, is attached to proteins that are not needed, and so that basically targets them for this thing called the proteasome, which is this cluster of proteins. It's like the trash can at the cell, so basically the... Uh, protein that's going to be, that's been targeted and is going to be broken down is put into the proteasome, if you will, and then broken down into its constituent parts, which can then be, can then be recycled. All right, we can do this section real quick. So here, this is a, the degradation of mRNAs. You have these types of non-coding RNAs called microRNAs, and there are these other ones called small interfering RNAs, and they have a similar job in that what they do is they are small stretches of RNA that bind to an mRNA, and when they do that, they either basically break the mRNA apart or prevent it from being translated. And so that's the job of these non-coding microRNAs and small interfering RNAs. Other example of non-coding RNAs are, of course, tRNAs and rRNAs. We've talked about them. They, again, are not responsible for directly producing an mRNA. Of course, they help in the process of translation, but they don't contain the code. So really, mRNAs are the only coding RNAs. All the rest are non-coding RNAs. Okay.